Would you call yourself a composer, a DJ, or a musician? Uh, a composer and musician. Hmm. Not so much a DJ. Um, I do make uh, DJ mixes, but I haven't used turntables for a long time. Um, so I make my mixtapes in the studio now, in the style that a producer would. And seeing as I'm not kind of beat matching like a DJ, I uh, when I make mixtape, we just do all kind of original remixes and complicated multi-layered mashups and stuff. So, yeah, I'd go producer and uh, composer, musician. Yeah, I do lots of stuff. And if you want to know more about the stuff that Joe is doing, you just have to follow the lead. Welcome, everybody, back to Vale of Sound, Interview Sunday. And um, some of you will be pretty surprised by the guest we have on our show here today amidst all the black male all the, the black metalers and all the metal guys that we usually interview i myself am very happy to have somebody here on the show who is not only musically a little off because um he is much more in the line of electronic music but also somebody who I already had the pleasure of seeing live and who flabbergasted me with the sound. So I'm very happy to have Joe Etchison here from Hidden Orchestra. Joe, thanks for joining. It's a pleasure. Um, to, to clue that up, I think I saw you like 13, 14 years ago playing um, a small festival in Essen in Western Germany. Um, and uh, oh, right. the, one of the Dinovali fests. And it was awesome mm -hmm. to see you perform. Um, so something that I always ask everybody here on the show first is, um, do you wear any kind of band merch, not even necessarily your own, but any kind of band merch at the moment? Uh, no, I don't, no. Do you, um, you go ahead. No, I was just, I, I, I think I've only ever had one band t-shirt when I was a teenager. That's do you know which one that band. was? Yeah, it was a Red Hot Chili Peppers t-shirt uh, when I was 14 that uh, somebody else gave me. Okay. Oh, you, somebody else gave you, so you didn't even have to buy it? Yeah, no, I, no, I'm afraid not. I see a line there. Um, yeah. Before anybody asks, I'm wearing Autre Noir, some nice Parisian, let's say atmospheric metal, uh, friends of mine. And uh, the second question is always, Joe, where are we catching you right now? Uh, I'm at home. Uh, in uh, the sort of live room of our studio. Um, yeah, I live in uh, the West Country in England now. I moved from Brighton last year. Okay, so you moved north? Yeah, north and west, out sort of towards Wales, yeah. Uh, in the countryside, yeah. Okay, so do you enjoy that now? Yeah, very much, yeah. I grew up um, kind of in this part of the world and moved around a lot, but... I was born not too far from here. So, yeah, it feels a bit like a homecoming. So the new Hidden Orchestra record, To Dream Is To Forget, out on September 22nd. Um, it's the first one that, or it's the first, let's say, proper full length that came out since uh, We Came From The Sun in 21. Um, and as I know that very often the process of writing, producing, and then also publishing takes a longer while. My question is, are these songs that you wrote during the pandemic or longer, or maybe even already after all the lockdowns and stuff? Uh, it's all three. Uh, so my working process is uh, very slow. I write stuff over a long period of time. And um, I had a lot of this album done in sort of 2017. Um, but at that stage, I was starting to try and work out the best way to release my music. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so I worked with uh, some majors and some indies with uh, varying results. Sorry, it's yeah. my kids just going out for a walk and waving at me. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, so some of it was done around 2017, but it took me a long time to figure out how I wanted to release music uh, going mm -hmm. ahead from there. I wanted to try and have more ownership of what I did mm -hmm. and, uh, and more control because uh, a lot of what makes Hidden Orchestra what it is is 
I do so many different things and um, I'm pulling influences from all the other work that I do. So I do documentaries and I make uh, art installations and um, yeah, so I'm, I'm pulling in all these different influences and it's nice for me to be able to uh, re reuse, well not reuse, but repurpose music in, in different settings. So for example, a piece of music that I wrote for a um, computer game uh, I also use in a forest installation with speakers hanging from trees and mm -hmm. um, I'm recording that in kind of 360 degrees so that I can then release that as a binaural and virtual reality experience. And these kind of things become really complicated when you're working with people that own all your music. Um, so, yeah, I wanted the freedom to do more of what I wanted uh, with the stuff that I make. And um, it took a long time to work out how to do that. So yeah, a lot was done that long ago. Some of it was written during the pandemic and uh, some of it was written from scratch early this year. There's a track I wrote. Uh, two tracks were written just in February this year. One is a, like a piano piece um, and the other is a piece that's made entirely out of noises made by a cello. Mm. Um, so all the beats and bass and melodies and everything are all just from one cello recording. You also founded or you also opened your own label along the way. Did I see that right? Lone Figures is the one that this one is released on. Yeah, this will be the first release uh, on that label. Um, so, yeah, that's that's all. Because, uh, yeah, I was working with a, re a really good independent label. True Thoughts. Um, yeah, uh, who were great for a long time. They, they still own a lot of my music for uh, a, a lot of years, so... I'm, I'm still got a good relationship with them. And I worked with some smaller indies who were really nice to work with and um, gave me a lot more freedom and control. But um, the distribution and, and marketing and stuff was a bit harder to do with that kind of smaller budget. And then I had an offer from a big major label, uh, which all my friends and advisors told me to take because uh, it was a pretty good deal. But something about it just didn't feel right. You know, I felt like becoming too, you know, too small a part of too big a machine. Mm -hmm. uh, and it didn't, just didn't feel right. Mm -hmm. So I decided that I wanted to take this kind of model that a lot, a lot of artists are taking increasingly where you work directly with distributors mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I managed to get the money together to be able to do the manufacturing and promotion and make those kind of decisions and stuff. Mm. And uh, it's been really kind of creatively liberating. I've been able to do a lot of kind of non-traditional sort of approaches that, uh, you know, I, I get to decide upon. Like, for example, the first uh, single we released from this album, and instead of making like a standard kind of music video, uh, I made an interactive app with uh, an animator and a programmer and um, made a kind of app where you can play the music yourself by tapping on puppets to make them play all the different instruments and turn them on and off again and that kind of unusual approach uh it's, it's the kind of thing i really enjoy which also then gives the listener basically some kind of freedom to more or less create their own version of the song i've i've seen the video i like it a lot i like the interactive part and i also like the ability of even more clearly identifying the single layers of it. So that is something very, very unique and open. Is that important to you that the listener understands how you are made, how you are doing it in a way? Uh, I really, I really liked, yeah, offering that uh, sort of insight into the process. I'm aware that because I'm working on these things for so long and they're so dense and thickly textured, uh often when i've given like stems parts from the tracks to producers for remixing them they go like oh i, I had no idea this was in the original there's a whole like brass band there that's mm. just buried in the texture um so yeah it's really nice that's another thing that the remixes can do you know sort of lift lift the lid and see it see under the surface of what's going on but that kind of um more open approach is something that that I learned when working on that game soundtrack I did um, where I managed to use the software that would let me um, 
make it so that the music was different for every player every time they played the game and each time you hear it it sounds different um and i found that really inspiring and it's something i've tried to bring into all the different parts of my work mm -hmm. um you've already mentioned the the multitude of layers that is in your music but at the same time there is something about it that makes each song sound very i don't want to say naturalistic or realistic or organic but it sounds as if it on the majority has been performed by a normal band is that also something that you are looking for to use all the electronic things that you use and still have this kind of real sound absolutely yeah uh i mean that's sort of uh deeply sort of woven into the origins of the project um like it's a, a hidden orchestra it's like a an imaginary orchestra is one way of interpreting that um so i've always tried to kind of make electronic music but by acoustic means mm. uh, so using natural sounds and real acoustic instruments and real musicians has always been a really important part of my process And yeah, when I'm like micro editing drum patterns and stuff, I'm always trying to make it sound like there's a drummer actually playing that, um, taking little groups of hits rather than individual hits, mm. grouping them together so it sounds much more naturalistic. Yes. And yeah, yeah, that's that's what I'm going for. And one of the articles that I read while doing the research for this interview, I read something uh, very interesting and I would like your opinion on it. Uh, the person said, well, here we basically have um, a one-man big band in the studio and a multiple persons big band on stage. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's always been a really important part of the project is to try and bring... Uh, so I'm, I'm working alone in the studio, mm -hmm. but I get lots of different musicians to come in and I layer up recordings of them. So the string section, you know, it might be... 50 parts but it's played by two or three musicians mm. sometimes it's just one so i'm creating these big thick textures mm. um and i'm very lucky to have worked with all these amazing musicians from i like getting people from different backgrounds from you know a lot of classical and folk players and then yeah trying to interpret that live um yeah the band can be anywhere from two to ten people mm. um Yeah, it's going to be a slightly different approach on the upcoming tour because um, it's just going to be me and uh, the two drummers. So, because oh. um, one thing I really like about um, making and performing uh, is taking really soft, quiet sounds recorded really closely, kind of like my voice is today. Oh, yeah. Um, and then playing them back really loud over big sound systems mm -hmm. and... Uh, that kind of juxtaposition of a, a soft sound being heard loudly that kind of thing is much easier to achieve when i'm um controlling all the parts myself and uh so yeah it's, it's going to be a slightly yeah. different tour this time leaning more into uh, i worry that in the past we sometimes tried to replicate the studio records on stage and we were focusing on that accuracy So this mm -hmm. time we're leaning more into like the vibe and the liveness and the energy and the um, emotion of it all and uh, make it darker and, and heavier and focus on the live visuals and the drums. And yeah, that's going well, I think. You, you've mentioned the, the musicians that you have backing you, for example, like Poppy Aykroyd or your two drummers, Jamie and um, Tom, right? Um, Tim, yeah. So when you're, when you're writing, your stuff and when you're composing your music do you already have these people in mind or because every musician has its own way of playing right so do you already have those specific people in mind or only the instruments uh i try try not to have too much of, of that in mind um i find when things go wrong for me it's when i'm trying to write music like I think people might want to hear or um you know so um for example uh, with Poppy like I, I play all the piano on the albums um she does the violin and then in the live show she plays piano and violin um but there's usually you know 
quite often there's three or four piano parts so we have to make new arrangements of the, the piano for her to play and with the drummers tim and jamie um a lot of the drums on the records are performed by them um but we'll do it in unusual ways uh so for example i'll get them to come in and record some like classic kind of drum breaks that i can chop up and sample and reprogram sometimes i'll get them to improvise over tracks i've written or even sometimes tracks by other people or just completely unaccompanied soloing and i do this with all musicians not just the drummers but i get them to come in the studio and play for 20 30 minutes or more and um you know, I'll give them some direction. They might play along to something. There might be something I've written that I ask them to play. Uh, it might just be improvisation. And then I hunt through that like I'm, you know, digging through a record looking for samples. Um, it's the same approach with field recordings as well. So I'll go out and record nature or the city at night or some old broken machinery or anything and then listen through it, waiting for that little bit of rhythm or melody or some kind of, you know, interesting bit of audio that sparks off uh an idea and then i i take that and develop it or you yeah. go or you go full-fledged ornithologist and record some birds for skylarks mm -hmm. yeah yeah i did a whole album of uh where there was birds on the whole way through dawn chorus each one was had a, a yeah a morning bird recording from somewhere all around europe um yeah that that was kind of my birds album but uh, they've crept onto the, this couple of tracks on this one as well. Which is, again, another interesting thing about it in orchestra, I think. You know, uh, we we have somebody who uses a lot of modern machinery and at the same time uses these modern machines in order to enhance naturalistic sounds. Yes, 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 I know, doggy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, that's... So that is something that I found very interesting, this juxtaposition. <laughs> um, how hard is it for you to abstract these naturalistic sounds into your music? Uh, how do you mean? Sorry. Well, you, you, you said you listen for certain... I mean, you go out, you record okay. something, and you listen for those little tidbits. Mm -hmm. uh, are you already at that moment aware, okay, this could lead me here, or this could lead me here, there? Or is it just, okay, I like this sound, and I'll record it, and maybe at some point later I'll use it? Yeah, it's that second one, you know? Um, I often think it's like going fishing, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, when you're out recording sounds... Uh, you know, it could be in nature, it could be in, in the city, it could be anywhere. You know, I've recorded um, ventilation fans in hotel rooms that have a really kind of like, yeah, yeah. you know, and with that one, I'm thinking, oh, that's got a cool rhythm. I'm going to find yeah. a cool little loop in that and loop it mm -hmm. up and, and, you know, maybe put a drum beat under it and then you'd be playing that and I'll try something out in the double bass and, you know, and then I'll, some chords and uh, a track appears. Um, but yeah, when I say it's like fishing, you know, it's, you, you're not, you don't know what you're going to catch. Mm. Um, so you go out with your microphone and you see what you stumble across. And yeah, mm. it's very much like, like you were saying that second example of, uh, there's something I like, um, record it, see what happens. Which also means that you must have a rather vast library of field recordings. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I used to work a lot in radio, uh, documentaries and dramas, that kind of thing. So it was always nice to have, um, you know, different recordings. Mm -hmm. like, I was in London last weekend and um, there was a massive thunderstorm and I, I just recorded a bit out the window because I thought, you never know, uh, it might mm -hmm. be nice to have some rain hitting roofs in a city setting. It was really mm -hmm. impressive, loud rain and rumbling thunder and I thought, you know, I might, I might not get to use it for music, but it might be that a friend needs this sound for a film they're making or something, mm -hmm. you know? I've got a scene mm -hmm. go, come to me, have you got anything from, you know, Germany a few years ago when it's rainy or, you know, the streets in winter or... Yeah, it's, I, I've got a big collection. and it's, uh, it's I find uh, it's a bit like having a, you know, a photograph collection, travelling mm -hmm. around 
making sound recordings and i find you know when you put the headphones on you're transported back into uh, not just a static kind of image like you have with a photo but a, a real memory of an experience and it can really mm. transport you back there so yeah. it's something I, I treasure that's also something that i had imagined but then again let's cut to the songwriting process itself or the composing process how must we envision you writing songs for hidden orchestra is it is it something that is like a constant work on one track or is it working on several tracks or several things at the same time yeah it's uh the second one um Sometimes I find a bit of focus and especially if something's going well, then I'll work on that for a good while. But uh, I mean, I'm self-taught as a producer and, um, you know, that has some benefits and some shortcomings. Um, one of them is that I, I can easily end up going down a rabbit hole of something that's just not going right. And instead of banging my head against a wall too long, I just leave it, you know, I work on something else and mm -hmm. uh, come back. It might be days, weeks, months, even years later. Um, like, you know, the first track on this album, I think I said uh, the first single, Little Buddy Move. Uh, yeah, not the first track, the first single I meant. Okay. Um, that one I started in about 2008, I think. Wow. And then I left it till 2016. And then I picked it up again in 2019. And then I finished it in 2022, you know, but I wasn't looking at it in those gaps of, of several years in between. I uh, kept coming back to it thinking, there's something here, but I just can't get it right. Um, mm. You know, and maybe I still haven't, but you've got to draw a line under it somewhere. Well, then it's the question, right? Do you have to draw a line somewhere or can you also, I mean, like this track then was in 14, 15 years in the making. Uh, do you have to draw a line for yourself or do you also admit, not admit, permit yourself to keep tracks open for as long as you want to? Uh, yeah, uh, I've slowly evolved a kind of way of, of finishing things. Mm -hmm. um, so I found that, you know, if I tried to get something I was completely happy with, uh, you know, I would I would never release it. Um, and if I ever did manage to create something perfect, then I should probably stop making music. Um, because, you know, you know, I think it's impossible to achieve that, that kind of perfection and to keep striving for it. And, you know, and so generally my working process when it comes to finishing music is I have a list of, of things, ideas, you know, notes that I've made for the track, like, try putting this kind of beat in here or maybe try, you know, EQing that brass section or something. And when I get to the point when I'm doing stuff on the list and I'm not sure whether it's making it better or not anymore, that's the point in which I say, right, okay, it's done. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the flip side of that, the really interesting thing that's come about, again, starting through that game soundtrack I did, is working with um, well, sort of AI, basically. Mm -hmm. um, not AI that creates the music itself, but the rewarding way I found to work with AI is through structure and arrangement and that ability to draw a line under a track but still leave multiple uh, compositional kind of options open in it. Uh, so it can be different every time and sometimes giving control to the listener of how long they want a track to be and um, when they want to move to the next section. Um, and when I've used that kind of software, I program the probabilities of it choosing different parts in a track. Um, for example, I might have 10 different beats and I'll say, you know, 60% of the time I want this main one, but then these other ones, you know, 5, 10, 15% of the time, those will be selected. And, um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, composing kind of like any creative chart task is like making a, a, a series of choices. And every time you make a decision, you're taking a fork in the road and that other fork, you know, remains unexplored. And when I'm working on these things over 10 or more years, you know, the number of unexplored avenues are, you know, infinite. 
So mm. if I can then create a way of allowing people to listen to music where all those, you know, all those different paths are still accessible, um, I find that really fascinating and, and compelling and, and rewarding, you know. Mm. Even when I'm listening, when I'm working on something like that and I'm listening to it, I'm aware that what I'm listening to has never been heard before. It'll never be heard again. When I press stop, you know, that's going to kill that piece of music. Mm. And it, uh, I find it really compelling. Have you ever been considered of, how should I say, of of opening up and letting people actually witness through whichever technical means, but have you ever considered them witnessing you composing? Like, okay, I'm I'm watching Joe while, or I'm observing Joe while he is putting it together. And when he goes this way, maybe I'm also able to go that way. Have you ever consider or would that be something that you would be up to like completely opening up yeah um i don't know i think it might be kind of boring for people because <laughs> uh as i say i work so slowly um yeah you would have to focus on one track yeah yeah but even then you know i might generally the way i'll start a track is with a some kind of hook to hang things around mm -hmm. Could be a beat, could be a bass line, could be a chord, yeah. could be a you know a weird sound. Um, and generally, I'll work on like an eight-bar kind of loop, um, and then extend that out, and then maybe add another section and switch between the two. Um, and it's only later I then extrapolate that out into a full piece and and have intros and outros and breakdowns and start putting structures from you know songs, you know verse chorus structures or classical kind of you know, sonata form or other kind of symphonic or compositional techniques. So, um, yeah, I think it'd be probably quite boring to watch, yeah. <laughs> but uh, there's something I really want to open up as a way for people to experience the final thing, you know, where they, right. they can start making these sort of decisions for themselves. Um, I released that soundtrack that I made as an app um so that people can listen to the album yeah. as it and hear it as it is you know in, in the in the game context so it's different every time and they they can choose the ways they progress through it but i haven't yet found a way to really um show what's going on kind of under the hood that's mm -hmm. that's something i'm really interested in and, and trying to work with different kind of artificial intelligence companies and and, and music technology people to try and uh find a way of really communicating that. I I just had this one thought rushing through my head uh, that when you say that you're working with AI in a way, isn't that like another hidden orchestra behind hidden orchestra? Yeah. 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 It's a, it's a, you know, the name has, has many meanings. Um, yeah. Like sometimes, uh, is a hidden orchestra and that it's creating music for a, a kind of movie that doesn't exist like mm. you'd have in an old cinema or theater we still have in opera and stuff today um it's a hidden orchestra in that when we perform live there's a lot of sounds you're hearing that are me controlling and manipulating things live on stage that you can't actually see yeah um it's a hidden orchestra i mean uh i discovered later on that one translation of uh, karaoke is hidden orchestra. <laughs> oh, really? Didn't know that. Yeah, karaoke, I think, is hidden orchestra or empty orchestra. Okay. Which makes a lot of sense, you know. So that That's good stuff to use in a conversation at a party, like, you know, like show. <laughs> oh, did you know that? Karaoke. Yeah, that's funny. That's cool. Um, and that is nerd stuff that, of course, a lot of us will now remember. Thanks for that. Yeah, no um, we have, or you have already mentioned the many different things that you have already done in your life as a composer, you know, soundtracks, computer games, uh, installations. Um, and especially the latter one, I think, is highly interesting because I guess that whenever you have any of these different outlets, your own band or any of these commissioned pieces, 
I guess that every time the approach must be a different one, right? Yeah. Um, it's something that I really enjoy. Um, it's doing loads of different stuff and diverse projects. And um, it's something I, I, in my early days, I found quite rewarding about trying to work in kind of commercial music a bit with the challenge that I'd get set to um, make a piece of music in a certain style. And um, I've always enjoyed having that kind of freedom and collaborating with other people and installations and things as well, trying to integrate what their expectations are with the things that I would like to do and try and make everybody happy. Um, yeah, I love taking different approaches and maybe it's not uh, the most beneficial thing to my career and I've never been able to focus on one thing. But uh, yeah, it's really rewarding. I mean, uh, one project I did just before the pandemic um, was working with scientists in, and doctors in neurosurgeons in Paris on soundscapes for coma patients. Um, and it was just really fascinating to be suddenly in a context where people are um, were saying, what do you really want out of uh, this this sound and this music in this project? And they're saying mm. it's, it's to decrease um, mortality rates. It's like, wow, that's uh, quite a, a mission compared to, you know, I want to make people dance or I want to make people buy this product or mm. I want to make people, you know, relax, you know, it's I want to save lives. And um, so, yeah, I really, I really relish every opportunity I get to take a different approach and try something new. Mm. Uh, coming back to my initial question about when these songs were written, to which extent the pandemic had something to do with it, the record's title, To Dream Is To Forget, is taken from a poem by Fernando Pessoa, the great Portuguese writer. Um, I quote, and I hope I got it right, no one tires of dreaming because to dream is to forget and forgetting does not weigh on us. It is a dreamless sleep throughout which we remain awake. Mm -hmm. uh, first question, how much of a fan of Pessoa are you or did you just like the quote? Um, I discovered Pessoa when uh, I was working on a, a radio drama adaptation of one of his books. Mm -hmm. um, no, in fact, no, it was a documentary about his work, um, mm -hmm. mainly focusing on the Book of Disquiet. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I was a, a fan of his work, um, not not a huge, like, obsessive mm -hmm. kind of fan, but yeah, massive respect for, for the, the work he created and mm -hmm. his very unique kind of um, outlook on the world. Um, and it was by chance later that I discovered having come up with the name Hidden Orchestra and searching for whether, you know, anybody else had used it um, as actually a very famous Pessoa quote, uh, my soul is a hidden orchestra. Um, I know not what instruments uh, sound inside myself. And it's like, wow, that's another really great uh, origin story of the, the hidden orchestra name. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I do like Pessoa and um, I've, referred to his work a number of times uh, my track disquiet for example takes mm. its name from the book of disquiet um ah. which this this title uh, for this album also comes uh, from there i believe um and yeah it's just a quote that i i really liked yeah and, and I, think... I mean like of course again to dream is to forget is an interesting line because basically Dreaming is quite the opposite of forgetting, is trying to, to cope or to get through with all the things that have occupied your brain. Um, and then it applies to the second part of, a, of, that, of that line where he says, like, to dream is to be sleeping and still being awake in a way. Um, so first question, um, do you think that, you know, we need all that we also need music in order to get clear with the things that have occupied us? Is that like an escape route for you? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
um, I think it can have a, a similar effect to that one that, that Pissarro is alluding to, you know, that uh, when you're in a dream state, you forget all of the the worries and, and pressures of a of a modern existence or just, you know, your day-to-day -day life. It's mm. like living in a, an alternate reality, um, you know, a dream through which we remain awake. It's like you're mm. living this kind of alternate existence. Um, but it also ties in with some kind of... Um, neurological theories about the way that we process memories um mm. like francis crick um had a, a theory called reverse learning uh, which i used as a track title on this album as well which is the theory that um when we're dreaming we're processing our memories in order to unlearn unwanted kind of material to free up space in our brains um, so it's a kind of reverse learning process. You're, you're filing away all of these experiences and ideas and, um, yeah, kind of uh, unlearning, essentially, uh, in order to create capacity in the brain to, to deal with everyday life. So, yeah, I think um, music certainly has that kind of, or can have that kind of cleansing effect. I mean, uh, you know, it can also be, something energetic and something emotional and uh you know music has has many layers and then of course i have to ask that question what was your best dream ever wow um you know i haven't been able For, to remember. please forget the wet ones <laughs> um i haven't been able to remember my dreams for a very long time um sometimes i do uh yeah i'm afraid not one clearly jumps to mind um the most recent thing i can remember from having a dream was when uh uh i thought i'd come up with a really great piece of music and uh had just about had the presence of mind when i woke up to remember it and record a voice note on my phone uh, it goes like, da, 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 da. <laughs> listen, back, listen back to it and uh yeah there was maybe there was something there but it wasn't as good as it was in my dream <laughs> well but honestly that was not a dream that is for reality you know mm. yeah yeah at least you know coming up with great music on your behalf um what also strikes me about your work is that very often your songs have a one word title not mm. necessarily but often yeah um do do you have like a, a, a how do you call it a thesaurus that you go through and say like ah mm -hmm. I like that word put it to the list ah I like that one or is it something that you really really have a long time getting through with you know like finding a good title for a track? Yeah, that's uh, always a tricky one. There's just one. Uh, so. Yeah, as I say, I'm working on things over long periods of time and yeah. the names of the tracks evolve and change. And when I first come up with an idea, you know, it might be just a few seconds of noise and uh, I have to save it as something uh, on my computer. Mm -hmm. So that name that, you know, I try to get beyond, you know, song three mm -hmm. and come up, come up with something at that stage. Um, and there is actually an example on this album of a track that I named uh it was I, it started with a drum beat it was just, i just wanted to write a nice kind of lazy swung kind of hip-hop beat with lots of like scattery little ghost notes on the snare mm -hmm. and so i called it scatter because it's got this kind of scatter mm -hmm. guns sort of yeah. approach yeah um, yeah that, that is one of the only ones that has kept its name from that first saving the file through to being on the record mm -hmm. but yeah i do really like punchy little one word titles um yeah, I don't know what it is that that I'm drawn to there. There's a good old friend of mine when I shared this album with him. He was like, "Wow, you've got at least four really classic hidden orchestra track names on there that I can't believe you haven't used before." That, that yeah. is true. I also saw it, and I was like, "Hey, didn't we already have that?" Yeah, did, did, broken, scatter, uh, even yeah. hammered in a way. I felt like, okay, that, that, okay, yeah, but I know what you mean. There, there are some on there, definitely. Um, but what is more important that, at least to me, is that we got a lot of, for lack of a better word, let's call them classic hidden orchestra tracks 
And sometimes there is, and especially with this record, um, I had a feeling of it being a very British record in a way. It sounds as if it doesn't hold back on you being a Brit and some kind of British roots. I mean, Hammered itself could also be a club hit, you know, somewhere in in, in London in the 90s. Uh, or or mm. a little buddy move to me sounds a little off BT, you know, like a little a little reggae or ska infused or some other tracks, as with a lot of your tracks also have a kind of northern soul vibe, at least to me. Um, would you say that Hidden Orchestra, the way that it is as a project now, it is a a very British thing? Honestly, that's a question that has never occurred to me. Um, I mean, I suppose inherently in some sense it is. Mm -hmm. Um I'm trying to think, yeah. I, I've always thought that, uh, you know, I mean, I think what everybody, everybody who's creating music is essentially repurposing and repackaging their influences. Yeah. Um, and the originality comes from the ways that, that you combine all your influences to create something new. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's very rare that there is something truly original. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, this is a thought that goes back to Brahms, for example, who, who believed that you had to hear all of the music that had ever been made before you could start making your own. Um, but, you know. Difficult thought, nowadays, you know, right? Yeah. You know, like the last person to read every book that had been written was, what, five, six hundred years ago. So, yeah. And now if you were to, to attempt it, it would take something like 20 million years. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's an impossible task. Um, so I think, you know, we're all just muddling along. Everybody's bragging and uh, just trying to do their best. Um, what was the question? Whether you would agree that it is in some kind of way a British project. Right. Yeah. So I guess my influences, that's why I got onto that. Um, a lot of my influences are kind of um, from my real young childhood, the sort of classical and choral uh, traditions and there were some you know important british composers like the british pastoral kind of scene of uh Vaughan williams and gerald finzi um and john taverner and then stretching further back i am really into sort of william bird and thomas tallis and uh, early sort of sacred choral music which had a real shaping of my aesthetic i think um, and then stretching further forward, I guess, yeah, some bands like uh, Radiohead or Mogwai and uh, uh, quintessentially British kind of things in some ways. But then at the same time, I'm heavily influenced by hip hop and um, whether that's DJ Shadow or DJ Crush from Japan. Um, and then world music and folk music traditions, Africa and Europe. So, yeah. Uh, I find it very interesting that you you think it's very British. Um, I'll certainly be thinking about that. I'll, I'll also I, I'm, so to give you food for your thought after this interview. Um, I I thought about it because um, I always witnessed British the British music scene to be highly eclectic. Um, I mean, at the same time, you could have bands like Radiohead, Mogwai, and the Sugar Babes being in the top 10 or top 20 or top whatever you want to call it uh, or on top of a pops <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, that is something that when I compare that to Germany uh, where I'm from or also partially to the US uh, in the US you have these huge scenes every scene is huge and you stick to your own you very often don't go outside the bubble in Germany you usually have like one big music trend and everybody follows that for three or four years at least for people who listen to radio um which i don't uh, and and that is something that when i compare those three countries to each other then i always have a feeling as if the british music scene and the british understanding of music maybe also because of a colonial past and everything connected to it is very very eclectic um and and that's why i thought about that you know uh, yeah, it's very interesting. 
Yeah. And I think you're right. There's something tied in with the history of the country as well. Um, because it's defined by uh, immigration, essentially, yeah. Um, yeah. stretching back to you know, a long way back, but, you know, say William the Conqueror in 1066 um, and, the, you know, all, all the way since the immigration from all over the world and some of the terrible colonial things that happened. Um, I think it's a country that is very much defined by its influences. Um, so, yeah. Maybe that 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 is that holds true. I have one last question before we come to the infamous quickfire round, and um, mm. maybe it's something that you don't even feel, but something that I, when I did my research, I I saw how much work you have done over the years, and with you especially, I also looked at other sources other than Discogs because Discogs only shows music released as music. But very often with you, one has a feeling as if it's not only released music that you have done, but also stuff that has been repurposed or released with a different purpose. Um, you have become a household name or a staple for a lot of people over the last, let's say, 15 years. Um, and there is also a certain kind of reputation that goes along with that. Um, has this reputation, or no, is this reputation a kind of another burden of pressure on you? Or can you free yourself from any kind of expectation? Uh, yeah, I'm honestly uh, not that aware of it, I suppose. Um, one really difficult thing with the pandemic has been um, the, the the lack of that kind of feedback from your audience, you know. Um, it was three or four years, basically, because we're, we're taking a year off to have a child, and we're just about to hit the road again in March 2020. I literally had all the band hit down and rehearsing, and we were about to get on a plane, and we decided mm, this this uh, illness going around doesn't look too good. And, you know, we don't want to get stuck anywhere. Mm. And uh, we took the decision to cancel the shows. And fortunately, otherwise, I would have spent most of lockdown in Luxembourg, I think. Uh, so nothing against Luxembourg. It's a wonderful city and country for everybody who listens to this. I love Luxembourg, and it was uh, one of the first places we went after the pandemic and had a really wonderful time. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, nothing against Luxembourg, but I would have felt a bit distant from my family yeah. and uh, my studio. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, not not playing live. Um, you don't get that feedback, you know, mm. from, from uh, an audience when you're releasing music digitally or like some of the installations I do, I go and set them up in a forest and then I come back and take them down again. And uh, sometimes I don't ever get to see anybody there actually mm. enjoying or experiencing it. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't think of myself as, as like a household name. So maybe that helps with not having too much pressure. Mm. Um, whenever I do try and fulfill the expectations of what I imagine my audience uh, might want to hear, that's generally when things go wrong. Uh, so I try and just continue making stuff I want to hear, mm. my own pleasure, and uh, I'm always very um, feel very blessed that there are other people out there that that can get something out of it as well. A lot of people do. Don't worry about that. Hmm. Um, so we come to the infamous quick buy round. You get two alternatives, like. What do you prefer, Coronation Street or East Enders? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you want um, any context or just the answer? What? So, so do I tell you why or do I just say East Enders? Yeah, both. Just choose one and then give a short explanation for it. And as you okay. have spoken about movies and composers, let's start off with something in that realm. Uh, Hans Zimmer versus John Williams. Uh, John Williams. Uh, because he's more associated with my childhood, uh -huh. and um, uh, yeah, there was in 
in some of Hans Zimmer's earlier kind of work, I felt uh, he was using too much of the kind of fake orchestra kind of stuff, like mm -hmm. synthesized orchestras. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, that's just how um, orchestras get recorded these days and pianos as well to almost kind of sound a bit fake. Mm -hmm. uh, but John Williams, yeah, just the, the sheer magic of what he does. Hans Zimmer is nothing against him. He's a very interesting composer. Um, but John Williams. If you could choose an, another soundtrack project next, would you rather compose the soundtrack for a new video game or for a new movie? A uh, video game, uh, for the reason that I can take that more open uh, mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. uh, I found it so creatively inspiring. It's had a big influence on everything I do. And... Um, yeah, I, found, I just found it very rewarding. And I, I've okay. got no pastoral experience in games at all. It came mm. completely out of the blue for me. And uh, yeah, quick fire. Talking about movies and big soundtracks. Um, Mission Impossible versus the Bond series. Uh, well, it's got to be the Bond series. Uh, John Barry, an incredible composer. Um. And also, you know, uh, like I love the propeller heads reworking of a load of that material. Mm. And um, I'm, I'm forgetting the name right now. Uh, a composer, David Arnold, is it? Could be. Yeah. Um, yeah, the way people have, have taken the, the, the baton from John Barry and, yeah. and reinterpreted some of these classic mm. kind of uh, riffs and hooks, it's, that's, that's big music. Yeah. Although we also have to say that both movie series have like a so distinct theme, like you know, like the Bond theme. Everybody knows it. Dun, 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 dun. Everybody knows that. But at the same time, also everybody knows the Mission Impossible one. You know, that's yeah, uh, yeah, if not more, mm. it maybe if not more, yeah. But I think that is also something that is so amazing about both original composers that they came up with. A melody that is so distinct that you can basically put it into a lot of contexts, right? Yeah. I myself would yeah. not be able to choose between those two themes. Um, but unfortunately, what? I don't have to. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, moving a little bit more into the present. Madness versus the specials. Well, I mean, the specials, uh, they, they've had quite an interesting uh, career uh, in the way things have, have fractured and reformed for those guys. Um, I saw the Jerry, Dam Jerry Dammer's special, a.k.a. Um, at Glastonbury a number of years ago. It was a very special moment. They were sort of doing sort of Sun Ra orchestra covers mm -hmm. and... Um, throwing in, you know, Ghost Town and stuff like that. Um, but then, you know, there's some really great, fun Madness tracks as well. I'll go specials. For Ghost Town. <laughs> yeah, that is that is one awesome track, uh, which has been covered by The Prodigy. That was one of the craziest covers oh, I've ever... I don't know if I've heard that. Um... You just mentioned two two DJs, and I was I I had to laugh because when I was compiling this list, I originally lined them up, and so I have to ask: DJ Shadow versus DJ Crush. Uh, it's going to be uh, DJ Shadow. Yeah. Um, yeah, Crush. Um, I, I love the chunkiness of his beats. Yeah, and. Um, there's some really, really standout tracks there, but DJ Shadow was a big influence for me in the early days, um, especially as I didn't understand that much about sampling when I first came mm. across the first album entirely made from samples. Yeah, yeah, and I bet that there are still people out there trying to figure out every sample that he used on introducing because there are no instruments on there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's an amazing record. Yeah, it is. It's also when it comes to electronica, um, 
I would say it's still one of the top five records that I own. Still, yeah. because it's just timeless. Um, a little bit more aggressive electronic music, aka drum and bass. Ronnie Size versus LTJ Bukem. Oof. Bukem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bukem. Um, I met him once um, when I lived in Edinburgh. I used to go uh, drum and bass clubbing two or three times a week at one point. And uh, he came back to one of our after parties. Very nice man. Um, but his kind of crossover trip hop stuff as well, the Earth series, that had a really big influence on me. That was one of the first places I came across people combining like nature recordings with electronic music. And um, yeah, I think it's got to be Bookham just edging that one. Maybe uh, Ronnie Size and Represent for the live show. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and Bookham on the headphones. Funnily, I was just thinking the same thing. Yeah. Uh, to give you a break from the music alternatives, um, you have spoken about, uh, or you have indirectly hinted at your interest in i don't want to say medicine but psychology um so i'll give you classic psychology like freud and jung versus neuropsychology uh, uh, i wouldn't pretend to be well informed enough to to make a properly uh intelligent decision there um, if you had to go down the rabbit hole in either of those two well, I'm glad you're not asking me to choose between individuals. Probably Jung over Freud, if you were to ask that. But uh, um, yeah, I'm I'm interested in in neuropsychology, mm. and you know, I think you know these uh, these are fields where discoveries are constantly being made. Mm. So I think yeah. you've got to go with the the more up to date uh, iteration. Yeah, and also the one which is giving more chances to change the future, right? I yeah. see that. I have three more. Okay. Portishead versus Massive Attack. Uh, Portishead. Uh, Beth Gibbons' voice and uh, the Live at Roseland New York album. It's one of my top records. Yeah. Uh, that might be one of the best live recordings ever. That's true. Yeah. As the first reason for your choice was a female voice, I'll give you two female voices. Joss Stone versus Adele. Oh, uh, I, to be honest, have never listened to either, especially. I wouldn't be able to tell you what the differences were. Um, but if you had to choose on the singles that everybody knows. I I honestly don't. Okay. Uh, I guess probably... Adele, but I couldn't sing you a single one of her songs. Or oh, come on. Them. Hello. Well, it's like, ever, ever. Hello. Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, uh, but I know I'm what you mean. More familiar with Lionel Richie's Hello. That's um, true. And I still believe she knew about that when she released <laughs> that record. Uh, last one. You've been speaking about hip hop. And mm -hmm. I know you might be mad at me for giving you one classic and one a little bit more modern, but. Run the Jewels versus Gangstar. Oh, well, Gangstar. Yeah. Um, DJ Premier. Um, such a huge influence on me. Yeah. Yeah. I'm afraid that that's... That that's would a also be a collaboration, but I would have loved to see, you know, you, Premier, and Guru. Oh, that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'd have loved that too. Um, Is there anybody that you would like to work with? Um, now is your chance to say it. Yeah. Uh, Johnny Greenwood. Okay. Uh, from Radiohead. Yeah. Yeah, to see what happens. Yeah. Uh, might, not, might not work. Might do. But I mean, I'm honestly interested in working with anybody that wants to work with me. Um, uh, someone who takes that kind of interest and mm. feels like you know, if I feel like they're they're into and understand what I'm up to, then I have a good feeling that I'd like to learn more about them. Yeah. 
I mean, like you, you would also have to tell them, you know, we started in 2023, but release date is 2014. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't arrest these things. No, too much rush, right? Yeah. So, uh, Joe, thanks for your time. Thanks for your answers. It was a pleasure for, for me. I hope it was also a pleasure for everybody watching this. If you liked this, maybe give us a subscription here on YouTube or give us a follow or a like on any of our socials. Find us on Facebook, on Instagram. Um, and if you want to do a little bit more, maybe you can head over to our website where you will find all the information about our Patreon. And um, now, Joe, for you, your chance for final last words. Uh, well, thanks for having me. It's been a lot of fun. And um, yeah, the album's out to dream is to forget on september the 22nd so um i would greatly appreciate your support yeah. so thanks for taking your time enjoy the rest of your day thank you you too take care thank you bye